welcome to a conversation on models of care delivery for children with medical complexity. My name is Rishi Agarwal. I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and a pediatrician at both Lurie and Larabita Children's Hospital in Chicago. I am the co-editor, uh, along with Chris Still, of uh, the supplement on uh, children with complex medical needs. Uh, and today we're going to be uh, talking about one of those articles in that supplement. Today's discussion features one of the articles from the March 2, 2018 issue of the Pediatric S Supplement, Building Systems That Work for Children with Complex Healthcare Needs. The articles in the supplement feature writing from leading healthcare providers, family representatives, advocates, policymakers, and researchers. The hope is that these articles will help to clarify some of the difficult systemic issues and challenges affecting healthcare for these children and point the way toward their resolution. Today's conversation is hosted by the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. You can, visit, you can access all of the articles in this series and stay up to date on future conversations by visiting their website, lpfch.org slash AAP supplement. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We want this to be a lively discussion and, and encourage attendees to ask questions. You can submit questions in the GoToWebinar question box. Thank you to those who submitted questions ahead of time. We will try to get to as many as we can. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be posted on the Foundation website and shared with all registrants via email. Now I would like to introduce our panelists for today's conversation. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Portis, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. This is the lead author of Models of Care Delivery for Children with Medical Complexity. She will review the article's key content and discuss improvements in care delivery systems for children with medical complexity. Joining us today are two great experts in the field. I'd like to welcome Dr. Maria Brenner, who is Associate Professor at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Trinity College, Dublin. Also with us is Dr. David Bergman, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Lucille Salter Packard Children's Hospital. Welcome to you all. We will start the conversation with a few words from Liz. Thank you for the introduction, Rishi. Today I'm going to speak about our recent article, Models of Care Delivery for Children with Medical Complexity. I'd like to thank the Lucille Packard Foundation for sponsoring this supplement and this opportunity to speak. I also want to commend the expert presenters from the previous two webinars on the emergence of complex care and meaningful family engagement from clinical care to health policy for leading very engaging and thought-provoking conversations. Hopefully we will do this today as well. Next slide. Here is a basic outline. I'll give an introduction and then review basic tenets of models of care, three categories of models, evaluative research, current gaps in care, and some concluding remarks. Next slide. First, who are children with medical complexity? From a systems perspective, these children are a group of children with special health care needs. They are a heterogeneous population of various diagnoses and clinical conditions. They have high dependence on technology, subspecialty care, resource use, and disproportionately high healthcare costs. Despite this, these children still have high rates of unmet and undermet needs. Care for these children, including nursing care, advocacy, coordination, symptom assessment, relies heavily on informal caregivers, most often their parents. The majority of this care is unpaid and underrecognized. This care usually occurs at home, but can also be in school. Many parents also report that the responsibility of providing this highly skilled care for their children still falls on them during hospitalization. In the day-to-day, -day, providing health care for children with medical complexity presents unique challenges and rewards. The multiple diagnoses and their polypharmacy, unknown and often poor disease trajectories, and multitude of providers makes care decisions laborious, let alone the fact that are, there are few evidence-based practices or best standards of care. So difficult, delivering care for this population is extremely rewarding. There is the development of close longitudinal relationships and mutual respect with patients and families, 
and the camaraderie amongst care teams and others in the field. There is the learning of a child's unique personality with whom we work, often whose understandings of, and abilities, and of course their sense of humor, are much greater than what their medical history would, would suggest. We likely all have patients who cannot verbalize, but sure can play great practical jokes. There's a lot of laughter in this work and there is joy, especially when families share stories of their child and enjoying their childhood. Last week while I was in the ICU helping admit one of my patients with complex GI anatomy, trach vent dependence for their fourth time in the last three months, his mom showed me a video of him laughing while riding a roller coaster just the day before for the first time. And every time I think about it, it brings a smile to my face. So why focus on models of care delivery? While conventional health care systems are not designed to deliver optimal care for children with medical complexity, these systems often prioritize acute episodic care and focus on care delivered within a hospital or clinic setting. Interventions are most often aimed at improving outcomes of single chronic, mostly adult diseases. In contrast, children with medical complexity deserve a system that is multifaceted a system that promotes the understanding of interactions between multiple chronic conditions, places an emphasis on preventative and goal-directed care, maximizes communication, and minimizes redundancy. An ideal care system is one that is holistic, recognizing that children receive a majority of their day-to-day -day care outside of a medical setting and therefore incorporates a focus on quality of life and caregiver wellness. Across the pediatric community, new and novel models of care have arose in attempts to bridge this gap between what conventional health care systems deliver and what optimal care for CMC involves. Our paper was written in efforts to categorize existing models of care to obtain a better understanding of current efforts. Whether these models are the future of care for children with medical complexity or a stepping stone to much larger system changes is still unknown. Next slide. Different types of models exist in the field and are ever evolving. However, there are some basic tenets for most models. These include providing acute and preventative medical care, as well as enhanced care coordination services in a patient and family-centered manner. Enhanced care coordination services emphasize continuity, familiarity, accessibility, early crisis recognition, partnership, and multidisciplinary teams. Examples of these services offered by current models include on-call lines that go directly to a team familiar with the patient, prolonged clinic visits, sometimes with the family staying in a room and several subspecialists or team members rotating in and out, the designation of a point person to establish relationships with the family, cross-location care, including inpatient rounding, home or school visits, identification and handoffs with community resources, family-led advisory committees, and the creation of emergency and shared care plans. Of note, only the models that directly provide hands-on medical care for children with medical complexity were highlighted in our article. Distinct from these models is a model in which a patient is assigned a case or care manager to coordinate care, for example, through an insurance company. Next slide, please. Recognizing that there are different ways to separate models of care and that sometimes there's overlap, we divided current models of care into three categories. One, primary care centered, two, consultative or co-management, and three, episode based. Specific model type or program often is the result of the expertise of its founding members, the needs of the local families and healthcare systems, and advice of mentors within the field. Many models arose in parallel. For example, the program in which I work, the Special Needs Complex Care Program at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin was founded by Dr. John Gordon, a pediatric intensivist by training. This was done at the request of the then Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Bob Miller, to improve continuity of care for a very small, very highly fragile, highly complex group of children who had recurrent admissions to the ICU and disjointed follow-up care. Given these foundational components, both the foundational provider and the need, 
Cross-location care with inpatient co-management and rounding and outpatient follow-up is a core tenet of our program. In contrast, other models have grown out of academic continuity clinics and focus instead on primary care outpatient management or have developed when a need arose with the increasing population of children with medical complexity in a primary care practice or hospital. For each category, I will review advantages, disadvantages, and emerging solutions. You may notice that the same basic characteristic of a model can be viewed as both an advantage and a disadvantage to care delivery. Across all categories, there remain questions about staffing ratios, ideal patient population, incorporation of parent expertise, what coordination services to offer, financial reimbursements, use of technology, and how to best share lessons learned. Next slide. The first model I will discuss is the primary care-centered model of care. This encompasses the American Academy of Pediatrics concept of a medical home. These centers focus on the full spectrum of care for a patient from birth through young adulthood. Prevention, immunizations, acute and chronic medical needs, developmental assessments, especially referrals, and are usually located within a patient's community. Advantages stem from long-standing relationships between practices and families. Some centers may even have relationships that predate the child's medical issue. Integration in the local community and culture can facilitate increased trust among patients and providers and a better understanding and access to community resources. These centers are often more convenient for families also to access care. Likewise, many primary care centers and physicians and nurses have been providing care coordination services and medical care for chronically ill, highly fragile children for decades. Disadvantages revolve around limited resources, infrastructure, and siloed healthcare systems. Often in primary care practices, there are few personnel trained in coordination and not enough time needed to see such complex patients, especially with the pressures of a busy practice. Siloed healthcare systems can lead to difficulty accessing tests and labs as well as subspecialty providers. And this system presents barriers to communication amongst providers, especially when using and relying upon electronic health records that may be different. Some children with medical complexity rarely see their primary care physician, given their reliance of subspecialty care. Emerging solutions to improve care delivery in this setting include children with medical complexity focused primary care centers and cross-practice collaborations to share resources, such as a dedicated care coordinator, telehealth, parent advisors, and success strategies. Next slide. Another category of models is the consultative or co-management centered model, like the one in which I work. Generally for these models, providers in a subspecialty, or more recently, general complex care program partner with local primary care providers. Advantages stem from co-location of patients and resources, both personnel and systems, usually within tertiary care centers. This co-location enables the creation of a specialized parental advisory and support group and can help facilitate direct communication and coordination among subspecialty providers. By focusing only on care for children with medical complexity, this model is uniquely positioned to train a multidisciplinary workforce to address the unique medical, social, and coordination needs of this population, aka the complex allergy team, if you will. Disadvantages revolve around the stressors associated with caring only for a high-risk, high-need population. Provider and staff burnout can be an issue when caring for these children, many whom do not improve clinically. Financially, these models can be hard to sustain without grants or institutional support, as the majority of care is delivered in non-face-to-face, -face, often non-billable encounters. The fact that most of these models are located at a tertiary care center creates obstacles in caring for patients who live far away and likely inadvertently focuses on care delivered within a hospital. Emerging solutions include community outreach reach whether by utilization of new technologies to disseminate shared care plans or face-to-face -face collaboration. Creating a staff of multi-skilled teams may help prevent burnout and improve job satisfaction. 
Next slide. The third category of model is the episode base. These are time or location limited interventions that focus on providing care coordination and medical care for a specific illness or transitional uh, period. Examples include inpatient hospitalist services for children with medical complexity, often for those with recurrent admissions, co-management teams with surgeons, and care and rehabilitation facilities. Advantages for this model stem from de the delivery of around-the-clock care. An episode of care is a highly impactful period of time. Families are often their most stressed, children are the mo their most vulnerable. Outcomes of changes to care plans or new technology can be assessed moment to moment. Chronic needs, including family education and goals of care, are often able to be addressed. Disadvantages revolve around the time and location boundaries of these models. Oftentimes, team members do not have contact with a patient once they are discharged or transition to another location, that is, until readmission. There's a high risk of discontinuity and fragmented care, and that the care plan created in the hospital is not feasible once home. Emerging solutions include cross-location care, including follow-up clinics, improved handoffs during times of transition, and transitional facilities. There are now across the country several transitional facilities that deliver care in the time between hospital and home, and these focus on education for families and medical stability. Next slide, please. Evaluative research on models of care delivery for CMC has increased over the last decade and more so in the last several years. Regardless of the model, most, but not all, data supports positive outcomes. These include cost saving, improved parental satisfaction, and a decrease in unmet needs. However, while these results are encouraging, these studies are often single site and single population. There are few randomized control trials on the impacts of these models. It is also unknown what outcomes would be if current models were scaled to meet the needs of a much larger population. To my knowledge, there is no comparative research among different categories of models of care for children with medical complexity. And there are significant challenges to conducting this type of comparative research. The first is the multiple population definitions of children with medical complexity and who to include in these studies. Second, there's a lack of standardized outcomes and questions about what the appropriate outcomes to measure are. Outcomes used currently, such as readmission rates and decreased cost, may not be the best markers of improved care for this population. As mentioned and highlighted in the previous two webinars, other outcomes may be more meaningful, including parental days missed from work, child days at school, functional ability, and as described by Dr. Antonelli earlier this month, family experience of care integration. A third obstacle that for this type of research is the variation in services and providers across models. It is unclear which or what combinations of services, where they are delivered, and by whom leads to positive outcomes. It is not known which of these services has the best return on investment and for which patient. Intuitively, it is likely a combination of services in, unique to each patient, family, and the specific moment within that patient's life that leads to improved outcomes altogether. But there is not yet data to confirm this. In the webinar last month, Dr. Stein discussed in more depth the complexity of evaluating care delivery and that it is very difficult to link outcomes with the specific care delivered. Next slide, please. Despite efforts to improve care delivery for children with medical complexity, there remain several current gaps in, of care. I will highlight a few, but this list is by no means exhaustive. Gaps include poor integration of medical and community service and the overall ineffectiveness of medical systems in addressing and impacting social determinants of health that affect all of our patients. Current systems have limited focus on mental and behavioral health services and enrollment criteria. There are significant difficulties and questions around transitioning to medical complexity to adult care. In the pediatric realm, we are focusing on care systems for this population, but this is not readily reflected in the adult world, and many families will say that supports are lacking. Lastly, the lack of sustainability strategies for models and the inadequate parent and caregiver in-home supports are major gaps in current care delivery. 
Next slide. Some concluding remarks. For any model, family, patient, and payer buy-in is key for success and sustainability. There's unlikely to be a one-size-fits-all model of care delivery for this population. Models depend on the context in which they developed, including the needs of the patient, families, healthcare systems, and the personnel available to do the work. However, ideally, similar services should be offered across models. For me, working on this article led to a lot more questions than answers about how to best deliver, deliver care for children with medical complexity. Several of these re remaining questions include, how do we define the value of the care we are delivering? How do we decide what population to include in these models? As highlighted in the other two webinars, the enrollment criteria inherent to these models of care, aka the who's in and who's out, means some children who would benefit do not get them. Should social complexity be part of enrollment criteria or medical complexity alone? Other questions include, what needs of this population are in scope of what a specific medical and care coordination program or practice can address? What needs can only be addressed with more widespread policy changes? What are some meaningful measurable outcomes and how do we measure them? What services are key to provide? By whom and for whom? What could be the downstream impacts of each type of model of care on parents, siblings, primary care providers, and local systems? How do we best engage policymakers in these discussions? And lastly, as discussed by Rylan in the previous webinar, how do we develop models that best engage, support, and acknowledge families who do the vast majority of care for their complex children? Thank you all for your time and to my co-authors, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Portis. We are now going to have uh, Dr. Brenner uh, provide some key thoughts on this subject. Thank you, Dr. Brenner. Thank you, and good morning and good afternoon to you all. Um, thank you for your earlier introduction, Rishi, and uh, to the Lucille Packard uh, Foundation for the invitation to contribute to today's conversation. Um, and indeed, um, thank you to Dr. Portes and colleagues for a very timely and interesting article um, for myself and the team here. My contribution uh, today to this conversation um, offers the European perspective based on work I lead across the EU, exploring facilitators of care for these children at the interface of acute and community care. And this is across 30 countries um, funded by the EU Commission Horizon 2020 project, um, which is part of a larger um, 6.8 million um, project looking at uh, models of primary care, which is led by Professor Mitch Blair in Imperial College London. In the time I have today, um, I want to specifically comment um, on the gaps in care which um, Dr. Port has identified and, and really which resonated extremely well with our work here. Before that, maybe just a brief word on the terminology that we use. Um, as, as uh, Dr. Portes outlined at, at the start of her presentation, and it remains so true to all of us who work in this arena, that there are many nuances in terms of the words we use to describe this group of children um, with medical complexity. And in my wider work to offer clarity on this, we recently completed a systematic concept analysis of multidisciplinary language use on the topic. And not to go through all of that at all, but, but just some key words that come out and, and are just so relevant to today's conversation. The key characteristics that continue to, to emerge all the time are the individual and contextualized uh, care that's required, the continuing and dynamic needs, and importantly, a phrase that, that repeatedly emerges, which is present across a range of settings, which is obviously very key for today's discussion. As Dr. Portes pointed out, and, and I certainly would agree, that each of the models discussed have their merits, but none offer a complete approach that could possibly accommodate all of the needs, the continuing needs across the range of settings. For example, in the primary care centered, centered care uh, approach, the ideal way forward in many respects for the, the, the child and family who are quite uh, settled in their community, but one anticipated outcome of such a model um, from, from the literature and from our practice would be um, an anticipated um, 
uh, positive uh, that it would reduce unscheduled care visits to paediatric emergency departments. But yet we know from the data in the UK and, and the US, um, which suggests that parents would still potentially bypass a primary care uh, service to go to, to an urgent care centre. Um, and we found in our work across the EU that um, parents repeatedly, even in the presence of uh, primary care centres, which have a specialty in complex care delivery, there's still a preference for 24-7 access to PEDs and PICUs. Across all three, so the primary centres, the consultative, the co-management model um, and the episode-based model, the issues of geographical location and ge geographical isolation uh, emerge and we're very familiar with that with our spread of countries and the part of the world I work in. And, and the second thing that is very resonant for us are the issues around staffing in terms of how could they be attained and how could they be re retained. Um, I'm also interested, and I note that the next symposium is on uh, the issue of care coordination, but I, I note that the use of the term a non-physician care coordinator, and I suppose from our experience looking at that um, and from a systematic review we, we conducted in that area, the term care coordinator is a very interchangeable term, but, but from our context here it would be very widely accepted that the person holding that post may be from across the multidisciplinary group. So, so just on the, on the early part of, of the conversation, um, I would certainly support the assertion of the no one size fits all, uh, as each model obviously has specific and particular value, um, but uh, that, and that children would require some aspects of each model of care at various points in their life. Though the unpredictability of care needs and the complex health and social care interfaces mean that identifying outcome measures obviously can be difficult. Therefore, in our work, we didn't specifically look at an ideal model. Instead, we identified three principles of care that transgress across all critical care junctures. And, and we identified those three principles of care as access to care, co-creation of care and effective integrated governance with, with specific standards under each. Um, in looking as and to come back to the specific gaps that were identified um, in the paper and the specific challenges, I just wonder what we might offer in terms of um, the challenges identified by Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Portis and and from and what we garnished from our own work here. So I just picked out a few of the key challenges identified, and I, I and I had an I wonder question about them. So the the first challenge just was the, um, where you talked about the integration of care that it's difficult due to due to data integration challenges. And we certainly found um, challenge, similar challenges in terms of communication of a child and family's needs, um, no defined system of documenting care in a manner that can be accessible for the family and the multidisciplinary team across private and, and, um, and public health care systems. We also found an additional challenge in the difficulty in identifying all healthcare providers. And our question was, well, how can integrated care exist if there is a challenge to identifying all of those who actually provide the care to a particular child? And I suppose of interest was that when we looked across a, a remit of different scenarios, we identified that, say, for children on, on long-term ventilation in the home, 60% of um, countries could identify all healthcare providers caring for that child. However, when you look at a child um, following a traumatic brain injury, where there's more complexity in terms of behavioural and potential mental health issues, only 34% of countries we looked at could actually identify all healthcare providers for that. So it just it did raise the issue about the, the integration of care is challenging in its own right, but it's a particular challenge if we have challenges in identifying who, who, who our cohort um, of health and social care providers are to begin with. Just a question for consideration on that, and it, it, it just struck me at the latter part of the presentation. When you were talking about um, the exponential um, uh, rise in the population of children with complex healthcare needs, and when you look at the magnitude of, of children and complexities that there are to, to consider exploring, it does raise the question that are we looking at access to specialist care underpinned on a rights-based or a needs-based approach? And I suppose what I mean by that is that is access to care a realistic goal or is it an optional nicety for children and their families if they're geographically distant from a tertiary care centre? So it, for, for me, it just raised a number of questions in terms of these are really hard questions and they're very big questions in the wider context of who do we deliver care to and how. But it is an increasingly important question to 
to consider um, in terms of, you know, is, is the type of care we want to deliver, um, uh, it, you know, is it actually possible or is there, are there reasonable expectations of where this care can actually occur? The second one that I picked up on was um, a challenge in the paper was about few models of, um, of care integrating mental health assessment and treatment. And I smiled when I read that because it reminded me very, very much of our work where we we looked at um, how many countries could actually include and do include mental health assessment in a care plan of children with complex health needs. And again, we found quite a lot of variation depending on the issue. But an additional challenge we found was that even if you do go that route and you have um, a, um, an, um, a procedure in place where you can identify the mental health or behavioural issues, um, there may not be sufficient services available to address the needs. So one thing that we have to consider when we look at the ideal model is, yes, ideally we should look at this, but then how do we manage expectations? Are, what are the resource implications of integrating mental health assessment and treatment? And could a system actually cope with what we find? The third challenge that I identified, in it, and as you rightly point out, crosses all models and crosses all of our work every day, is the issue of recruitment and training problems. Um, this we found in, in earlier work, before the European study, in earlier work that we conducted here in Ireland, where we found huge issues of trust um, in terms of um, uh, care providers and different care providers and parent expectations in terms of who would be coming into the home to care for their child. The ad hoc nature of care sometimes due to the exponential rise of children with complex uh, medical needs and challenges and governance of that care is, is a, a particular um, and current um, complication that we all have. Within the work I lead, um, one of my colleagues, Professor Anne Clancy, looked specifically at nurse training um, and, and identified that only um, in, in only 75% of the EU countries, there was actually specialised training uh, required to deliver care to these children. And that in, in six countries, there, was no, there were no paediatric options available for further training at graduate level. And I suppose the I wonder question is, what does that look like in the States? And is that an issue that needs to be explored and addressed? Because there is a huge issue in terms of um, education and training of people in the first place, but then retaining skills where there may be small populations. And in terms from a medical perspective and the medical training, uh, my colleague, Dr. Ingrid Wolf, found that, that having pediatric expertise in complex care was an extremely important factor for appropriate referrals from the community uh, inward. So, so I suppose in terms of questions for consideration, if we move towards a hybrid model, what are the implications of that um, in terms of multidisciplinary training and, um, and how do we begin the process of looking at standardization for that to ensure that a, a, quality, uh, a quality care is, is presented to the child and family? The last challenge that I just wanted to, to um, dwell on today was, was reading the paper and again, I'm very familiar with the challenges in terms of support for family and carers and, and the point that was raised was inadequate support for family and caregivers. And it, it took me to the, the whole issue again of the language that we use sometimes. Um, and I've, in our work, we would have uh, found quite, I suppose, not astonishing, but certainly of great concern. Um, still parents having issues about transparency in decision making. Um, we found that in the countries we looked at, although 80% of countries had family support systems in place, only 20% of countries were asking families what they wanted from that service. Uh, and I suppose, you know, that, that balance has to be really re reversed, but certainly balanced to make sure that the, the issue of paternalism is, is addressed and brought to the fore and discussed very openly. Um, we also find that where you've got an increase in non-governmental organisations with, with the greatest respect and with the best will in the world, but, but the level of ad hoc care that can happen, which is very normal where you're dealing with an exponential rise in children with complex care needs, but that also brings issues of governance and questions over what does quality care look like. And from a family perspective, how do we support them as we try and figure that out ourselves? Um, the, the, the last point that I just wanted to make on that was um, when we looked at significant changes that occurred in countries over the last five years in terms of their perception of how they uh, care for children with complex health care needs, one of the things that we found was that, there, that actually the integration of care, there was a perception that integration of care had deteriorated for children assisted with long-term ventilation, then for 
other children with other complex healthcare needs. And that, that was repeatedly accounted for by reference to the increasing number of children requ requiring assistance and, and concern regarding the inability, excuse me, of health systems to cope. And again, that just brings me back to the question of, um, you know, what is that, what does access to care look like? Um, what are the implications of our hybrid model? And is access to care, what, what is a real, what does realistic access to care really look like when we're trying to cope with increasing numbers? Um, and they're my, they're my key considerations for the moment. I look forward to any questions and the conversation that ensues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brenner. Now we're going to move on to Dr. Bergman for his thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Bergman. Well, good morning and good afternoon to most of you. Um, my comments today are really intended to compliment uh, Elizabeth, your wonderful presentation, and Maria, your, your very thoughtful remarks. I wanted to start out by giving you a little context for my comments. Uh, I'm currently with, I and my colleagues are currently finishing up a large healthcare innovation award, which involve uh, 10 children's hospitals and their complex care programs and 42 primary uh, care practices. And the intent was to try and to implement care transformation at these 51 different sites, uh, while simultaneously working with uh, managed care organizations and state Medicaid agencies in seven or eight states to negotiate alternative payment models. So a lot of what I wanted to talk about today is really uh, derivative from this work and uh, I'll try and cite some examples where I can. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is are, are complex care clinics just band-aids for a broken system? And I guess I would argue in many ways these programs were designed to fill unmet needs for care coordination and fragmentation of services. We know that the families we see have seen multiple specialists and particularly in children's hospitals often in the context of multiple specialty care centers uh, which also have their own care coordination, behavioral health, social work and other specialists. So even when we have complex care clinics in place we still have fragmentation of care both between the complex care clinic and between the various specialty centers. This is leads to redundancy of services and a need to coordinate the care coordinators, which I think is an experience all of us have had. But more importantly, it leads to waste. And with waste, uh, uh, it leads to the opportunity to do a gruesome cost and savings. Well, I have a big what if. Um, what if we took the accrued wisdom that we've learned in complex care, and instead of just confining it to the complex care clinic, where we're often seen as a niche player because we take care of so few patients. What if we really scaled that up and said, what we've learned in, can, in complex care can become a standardized care model across the enterprise. As you know, most enterprises, at least that I've encountered, don't have a standardized care model. Uh, but I think in terms of how we care for patients, particularly with medical complexity, we've learned a great deal and we could indeed build, build this out. So you could envision the creation of a care management service line, which would take the place of all those individual uh, care coordinators and social workers within the specialty care centers. And this, this service line would be agnostic to specialty and agnostic to diagnosis. Uh, it would care for all children with various levels of social and medical complexity. And I would argue by eliminating a lot of redundant services in the specialty care centers, you would accrue savings through decreased waste and increased efficiency. It would mandate that we better understand our patient population and seg segment, segment it more, uh, more in a more granular way with respect to social and medical complexity and be able to map appropriate services across the segment. Two of uh, the children's hospitals that have participated in our program have, have begun to develop this uh, care service line. And, and in particular, the uh, Cincinnati Children's Medical Center and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia have begun to move in this direction. The next point I wanted to touch was, what about all the work with alternative payment models that's going on? And how does this really impact care, uh, care model development for CMC? Well, as we noticed from, uh, from the, the paper, most complex care, care clinics are not financially sustainable often requiring 500,000 to a million dollars a year uh, in additional funds just to keep the doors open. And this deficit to a certain extent stems from a misalignment of needed services and those services that are actually reimbursed 
uh, by most uh, healthcare plans. What, what we've seen in the op, uh, with the development of alternative payment models is an opportunity, an opportunity to better realign reimbursement uh, in such a way that uh, we were able to reimburse the needed core care coordination and behavioral health services that these goods require. Um, so what if we are really begun, if we want to think about how we can marry our new care models to, to alternative payment models? What I would argue is that we really need, why we develop these new care models, we really need to be having conversations with our payers. And what do we have to know in order to start this conversation? Well, payers want to know what they're paying for. So you need a very detailed understanding of what services you've provided. They want to know, are these services evidence-based? They also want to know, well, if I invest in these services, am I going to see a return on my investment? Uh, so when you're denying, designing new models of care, you need to articulate needed services and the supporting evidence base. You need to estimate the cost for these services, both in terms of the number of FTEs, but also with respect to time motion studies. How much is each individual doing uh, to accomplish a given task? Third, you, you need, where possible, to look at what claims data you have to understand what the current cost is for caring. Uh, with children with medical complexity. Is there an opportunity for cost savings with better care management? Can you make an argument to payers that there's a return on investment? And fifth, uh, you need to perform an actuarial analysis uh, on what claims data you have in order to determine what kind of enrollment thresholds do you need in order to mitigate volatility in claims. Certainly in California, one year we had a a $10 million case of a, of a child with, with hemophilia. So you have to be able to know well, how big your program needs to be in order to be able to, to assume risk. And lastly, you need to find out what's the best fit uh, for your program in an alternative payment model. What we found in our experience with the Healthcare and Innovation Ward is that uh, probably a per member per month for care coordination services was the, was the best solution. But if you didn't, uh, carve in these kids to a larger population if you carved them out. We also found out that the actual PMPM PM for these kids could range from 150 to $200 PMPM, PM, which sometimes for some health cans can be a deal breaker right there. But I will say at least at Stanford Children's Health, we have been able to negotiate a PMPM PM for our com complex kids in the neighborhood of $120. Uh, a second uh, alternative payment model, which is being done by Wisconsin Medicaid, and and as Elizabeth knows, the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, and I think Children's Hospital at Madison, is the target of case management. And what what these programs have done is really do a detailed analysis on what their FTE commitment is in terms of time and um, and professional level for certain episodes of care, like intaking a new patient or maybe transitioning from hospital to home or maybe for maintenance care. And they're able to sign a cost for this. And I think where it's been revolutionary is instead of a fee-for-service model that uh, reimburses the provider, begin to develop a fee-for-service model that reimburses the team. And a lot of times this type of alternative payment model may be more attractive to, to payers. And lastly, there are some programs that are looking at upside and downside shared risk and, and global payments. But these are usually programs that also involve a, a large number of kids, often hundreds of thousands of kids, in order to distribute the risk uh, over a larger population. So the last area I want to talk, talk about is how do you tailor your delivery model to meet your family's needs? And, and a lot of our current discussion on model design is really focused on where it's going to occur, what kind of model, consultative or primary care, and what services we have to offer. On the other hand, if we look at the adult world of complex care, in addition to this focus on site and surface, there's been a much more granular segmentation of their patient population and a tailoring of care models to address the needs of these different segments. You know, currently, when we define children with medical complexity, we use predictive algorithms that retrospectively look at diagnosis, spend, and utilization. Uh, as we know, these are somewhat coarse, and there's still considerable heterogeneity within the deep different groups. And moreover, these algorithms do not factor in social determinants to health and behavioral health issues 
even we know even though we know that these are potentially strong drivers of costs in utilization. So I would argue is that we need, when considering new models, uh, a more comprehensive assessment and a more granular segmentation of our population to drive this kind of tailoring and customization of the care model. For example, we may decide to identify kids with serious mental health issues and family dysfunction, and we may want to tailor a model to meet that. Some examples like this, like the, the niche program in Oregon, which uh, has a unique model to look at uh, family dysfunction, may be a way of, of trying to tailor the model. In addition, we care for kids with advanced illness, often needing palliative care. How do we integrate that into our model? We may have teens involved with juvenile justice. You know, what do we do to, uh, to really to alter our model for that? The next step is we really need to map services to each segment or group. Uh, and as we do this, we may find and meet the needs of that particular segment. We may need to add new members to the team, or we may need to retrain current member, members. A good example of this is that some parent mentors or parent navigators are being trained in, in mental health and behavioral health issues. We certainly need to think of increased collaboration with other services, in particular behavioral health. And this may mean embedding it on the team, or it may mean a just closer liaison with departments of psychiatry or social work or developmental and behavioral pediatrics. And lastly, we need to think of cross-sectorial collaboration. And we are seeing this in the adult world uh, with, you know, with agencies that are involved with housing, juvenile justice, nutrition programs, and the like. And finally, when we're talking about targeting uh, needs, it's also important to realize this is a very dynamic population. These kids go in and out of medical complexity. There's a need for frequent uh, reassessment, but we're often stuck doing our reassessment based on claims data that we often get with a three to six month lag. So we have a need for real-time data uh, to get real-time classification. And I'm arguing that we're on the, uh, on the cusp of a data revolution right now. So if we can get all our kids wearing Apple watches or similar devices, there's a potential we're gonna be flooded with a lot of data and perhaps data from other venues such as juvenile justice systems that will allow us to begin to uh, develop predictive algorithms using machine learning and neural networks that will uh, allow us to do a more real-time classification and, and modification of our care delivery. So that's it. I hope some of this has been provocative and uh, there'll be some questions and, and comments from the folks, but thank you for the opportunity to speak. Great, thank you, Dr. Bergman. At this point, we'd like to hear from you, the listeners. We've already gotten some questions, uh, but feel free to continue adding them. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions that have to do with uh, payers. Uh, one, uh, Respondent, uh, well, one listener asked, uh, can you share any successes in getting payer, payer buy-in? Um, and then getting, how do you address some specific scenarios that, for example, when private in, a, a patient may have both private insurance and uh, Medicaid, they're dual covered. And um, issues around um, insurance company controlling approval processes for services. Uh, so, um, would would love to hear. Uh, maybe Dr. Portis, you could start out, and then you know others could could chime in um, about uh, uh, any thoughts about um, getting payers to buy into these models of care. Sure, thank you, Rishi. Um, even before getting payers to buy in for the models, is to um, be able to get institutional support. I think. The majority of models of care, there's been a hospital or clinic system that supported them. Um, and to get that first, um, to show that there are some positive outcomes within your population and to be ensure that you're collecting data from the beginning uh, that can be presented to payers. Specifically with our pro program with Dr. Gordon um, and his team at the beginning, um, they tracked how much time different uh, members of the care team were spending on care coordination uh, and other services for these families and patients and able to show our hospital uh, the amount of time that it took to care for these children. And then that same group um, it did a study that showed that enrollment pre and post in a program like ours uh, did lead to cost savings and that uh, allowed our program to start negotiations with payers with that data. So I think 
collecting data from the beginning, able to garner institutional support to show positive outcomes for the patient and families and the payer um, is important. So this is David, I'd just like to comment. And in our work in the Healthcare and Innovation Award, we were able to, to develop um, five alternative payment models with states and, uh, and managed care organizations. Essential to doing this was beginning the conversation with them very early in the game, sitting down with them to look at the claims data and, and see what you can learn, uh, and not to go in there with solutions and not to go in there with big programs that you think uh, need to happen in order to care for these kids. Uh, I think in this context, we were able to show data that we, you, you know, given intensive care management, you can realize savings and you can realize a return on your investment. And for some of our programs, they were willing to go at, at risk. And as I mentioned, for at least one, they were willing to get a fairly high care coordination fee uh, per member per month. The issue about negotiation with individual plans and with uh, Medicaid and with commercial plans, particularly around authorizations and things like that is, is vexing and, and drives us all crazy. I, I think perhaps the solution is to try and take an all payer solution and see if you can get agreement, agreement among your paper, payers that this, these are standards for care coordination that we need in place. These are standards for parent engagement we need in place. And these standards drive certain core services that have to be reimbursed. Uh, I think if you can start this no, negotiating with payers, I think to some extent they'll be receptive. But until you get agreed buy-in about, again, what services you're delivering and why we're, we're going to be mired in these day-to-day uh, -day battles with, with payers. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Brenner, uh, there's a few questions for you uh, from the audience um, that uh, perhaps you could address. Uh, one was uh, how do, in your research, how do payment models affect the final policy decisions and program developments? in terms of uh, patient-centered care. Uh, another person asked to, uh, for you to repeat your thoughts regarding potential outcomes to measure uh, 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 for care coordination with uh, children with medical complexity. And uh, there was also um, a question as to whether there are any publications um, available that talk about what your team has found uh, specifically about non-physician care coordinators and standards for the care system. Uh, so Dr. Brenner, would you like to address some of those uh, Questions? Sure. Th thank you very much. Um, the first point, just to go back to the, the, the previous con uh, conversation, the previous question, if I may, just for a second. One of the issues that we have in terms of pay in payment is that obviously across the EU there is no standard, um, no standard um, function in that regard. But one of the challenges that we have is, is, and to agree with Dr. Bergman, is that where you don't have agreement on standards and where where we can't say, um, and we are moving to that because we're just about to publish ours. But but when you when you, in the absence of that. Um, children aren't being recognised as having a disability and actually the, the term disability while, whether people like it or not but actually having uh, actually being acknowledged as having a disability has a huge implication on how payments would be arranged um, across a number of EU countries. Um, so the first question Rishi was uh, how do payment models affect care? Um, I have to I have to tell you that we don't know the answer to that because one of the challenges that we have here is the absence of data. Um, we we look to the US and I did a fellowship there in 2014 and and in terms of the rich data that you have um, in in terms of how you can. Um, map out your care and who, who is accessing care and all of that. We actually don't have that yet. We have processes in place where we're beginning to gather that, but collectively we don't have uh, data on that. So we don't have any uh, very specific payment models. What we are looking at are a variety of different models in terms of um, money following the patient, so whereby the, the parent is actually can access a a, a uh, money at the start of their child's illness or following diagnosis and they can map out how that works or in other cases it's where um, providers um, are contracted to deliver the care for the uh, over the duration of the child's life or for an intermediate period where there are substantial increased care needs. Um, in terms of my thoughts on outcomes, I'm, I just need to remind myself on that, what was that question again? 
The uh, question was about um, how do, uh, let's see, how do payment models affect policy? You, you talked about that one. And then yeah. could you repeat your thoughts re uh, regarding potential outcomes to measure care coordination for children with medical complexity? Yes. So in terms of measuring care coordination, <clears throat> one of the things that we did in our recent work, and this will answer the third question as well, um, was that when we identified the principles of care, we identified standards under each of them. So in terms of measuring care coordination, we would actually suggest that in terms of measuring co care coordination, you actually take it a step away and, and look at the standards that you have in place for the co-creation of care. Because where you have where you have standardized access to care, but where you have standardized co-creation of care, that's actually when, when you can begin to measure what care coordination really looks like for this population. When you look at the variety of how care coordination is understood, so it can be called you know, a key worker or a key manager, um, for as long as we have interchangeable terms. And that's why we, when we looked at this, we, we decided very much against um, we understand that the term care coordination exists, but the care coordination is just one aspect of co-creation of care that exists with the family and that instead of measuring that point of who coordinates the care and how, that we actually look at a more global picture of, of co-creation of care. Um, in terms of where where our work is at and where it can be found. Um, the website for the overall project that, that we're working on is www.childhealthservicemodels.eu and within that there are section on publications um, and <clears throat> excuse me, the work package I led was work package two and there are under the publication sections we have two, four substantial reports in total um, presented to the EU in the last two years um, and, um, and our, our our publications are in there and we have another two forthcoming publications where on the, on our principles and standards of care um, which we expect to be coming out in the autumn. Wonderful. Uh, we have an, a question about the role of telehealth and I'd like to broaden that question out. Uh, you know, this will probably be our last question because we're running out of time. For, uh, you all to briefly think about what uh, going forward, are there technologies that might be able to uh, make us rethink how we uh, approach uh, delivering care to this population and, and, and allow these models of care to evolve. Uh, Dr. Portis, uh, if you'd like to take a minute on that. Thank you, Rishi. I think, um, thank you so much for that question and looking at how we can use new technologies uh, to reach families in a place that is more convenient for them. Um, there have been some studies of the use of telehealth for care coordination um, within primary care practices, and these have found positive outcomes on coordinating care and parental satisfaction. Utilizing technologies, um, especially with face-to-face -face, um, interactions, whether by phone or through the computer, would enable um, services that are most often delivered in a hospital to be able to deliver it closer to home, and I do think is um, the wave of um, uh, ways in the future that we can best deliver care for families that live far away. At our hospital right now, some of our subspecialty programs are trialing uh, telemedicine consults uh, for patients and providers um, in the community. Great. Thank you, Dr. Porterson. Uh, we need to wrap up because uh, we're, we're just about at the end of the hour. So I want to thank you all for attending today's conversation on models of care delivery. Throughout 2018, we will engage in discussions with authors and experts in the field to explore ways we can improve the system of care for children with chronic and complex health care needs. The next discussion will be a conversation on care coordination on July 26th. Registration is now open. Please visit lpfch.org slash AAP supplement for all the details. On this page, you'll also find a recent report from Delaware Health and Social Services on managing the health care needs of children with medical complexity. A recording of this conversation and slides will be sent to all attendees and posted on the Foundation website. We are always looking for ways to make these conversations more engaging and welcome your feedback. Please be sure to complete the survey that pops up at the end of the session. And I just want to thank all of you for uh, providing questions and making our discussion uh, lively. Uh, thank you all and have a wonderful day.